Please pray with me. Dear Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations upon all of our hearts be holy and acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. After ordination, Sarah and I served a congregation in Texas. It was a great community, good people, and it was quintessentially Texan. You would not be surprised to hear the jingle of spurs in the grocery store, thanks to a ranch that wasn't far away. Or you might have to offer the right-of-way to a tumbleweed as you're driving down the road. In my travels on the plains that stretched forever there, I would often pass by an old church building. It had certainly seen better days, and it was matched by a sign that was stood in front of that building. It stated, the Church of God, and it was weathered, and some of the black paint was peeling off of it. After a while, that sign with its faded into the background, and I stopped noticing it. But one day, as I was driving down the road, I saw the sign and there was something different. Someone had added some fresh paint to the sign. Underneath the words, Church of God, the painter had carefully added the words, meets here. So the Church of God meets here. Now, as soon as I saw that, I thought, there's got to be a story there, right? Perhaps there was a conflict in the church that threatened to split, and so this was sort of come up as a way to try to bring the church together. Maybe, maybe a new pastor arrived, and he wanted to shake things up a little bit, or maybe just someone had a word from the Lord, and they wanted to make sure that was there on the sign. No matter why, I couldn't get that sign out of my head. The church of God meets here. These people wanted the world to know that the church was not the building, or the programs, or the committees. The church is not an institution. These people wanted the world to know that the bricks and mortar were temporary. They were a particular people, a people united in Christ, no matter where they were in worship, whether they're in worship or at home or at work or in the hospital room, they were the church. They lived their lives together, caring for one another, awaiting for Jesus' return. I think that sign would have brought a smile to the face of the Apostle Paul. I think he would have appreciated the effort to emphasize the church as a people, united in Christ, united in mission. In the letter to the Ephesians, Paul is writing to a congregation that is diverse. They have different ethnicities, different backgrounds, different economic backgrounds, different history, different stories. And the Apostle Paul is urging them to be one. I'm sure you didn't miss it. Paul wrote in that passage, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. Seven times, Paul says, one. Why is he so concerned about this? Because Paul knows that disunity can destroy. In the 1970s, Colin Turnbull published a study on the Ik people of Uganda. It's called Mountain People. As the modern world encroached upon Uganda, this tribe lost its traditional hunting lands. Their identity was so closely associated with the land that when that disappeared, so did their unity. There was nothing to hold the center of their society together. The Ik Ik tribe, the Ishian people, began to think of them only of themselves, living in a society of what Turnbull uh, described as mutual exploitation. Those who could not fend for themselves were the most affected. They would steal food from the mouths of the aging parents, throw infants out to fend for themselves, and abandon the old, the sick, and the handicapped to die without a second thought. Turnbull then wonders aloud if this description of a society without a sender sounds at all like our modern American society. Now, what's interesting is I think this happens to churches. When churches lose the center, when they lose their unity, people get hurt. 
churches that forget the role of the scriptures, the importance of the sacraments, and the unity that we have in Jesus Christ are vulnerable. Church conflicts are the worst kind of conflict. Christians who forget that they belong, who, to whom they belong, can be vicious to one another. There are bullies on the playground, there are bullies in the workplace, and yes, there are bullies at church. The church must have a clear witness of who she is. Otherwise, we give the bullies free reign. And on the other hand, though, bullies need Jesus too. And I have seen some bullies transformed by the grace of God and Jesus Christ, whose lives have become more than just simply being a bully. Leaving that aside, coming to show the love and care and respect that God desires for us. Paul doesn't center the unity of the church on a building, a particular ministry, or God forbid, the pastor. Instead, Paul suggests that the unity is centered on the Holy Spirit and to Jesus Christ to whom the Spirit is witness. David Lower is an elder in a Presbyterian church in Western Pennsylvania. Back in 2002, he went to the Sudan as, as part of a group from Shenango Presbytery out in Western PA. He tells the story of a man he encountered after a worship service. He, a slightly built old man dressed in traditional white Arabic clothing walked up to me. His thin face with short black whiskers was almost hidden by his turban. His eyes were black and he had the look of hurt and sadness that comes only with a hard life. In spite of the fact that he spoke to me in Arabic, I felt that, that, that he wanted to have a bond and that somehow I had to communicate with him. This man, incredibly different, different worlds apart from who this David Lower was, encountered him and was trying to communicate, and there was this difficulty then of trying to communicate. He, this man carried a, a short rod, about 16 inches long, and this is a, was used by the, these men to drive the donkeys out. And Lower remembered the stories from about the early Christians. You remember how they, would, they, they were in secret because they were being persecuted and so they would sometimes draw symbols in the sand, right? Like a, the, the symbol of a fish, right? So David borrows the man's stick that he uses for moving the donkeys along and he takes it and he draws a fish in the sand. And the guy doesn't have a clue what he's doing. So again, David kind of brushes aside the fish and then draws a cross. Suddenly, that man's eyes lit up. He chanted with excitement, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. And I repeated the same words with a feeling of joy, he tells us. That there was truly a bond between us. Can there be a better way for two strangers to come together than through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? No amount of conversation could have conveyed the feelings and message that my little sand drawing had done. These were friends, friends of Jesus. The unity that we find in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit can overcome differences in geography, in language, in culture. We find ourselves truly able to love the stranger because of what we have in Jesus Christ because of what he does for us. But let's be careful here. Unity does not mean uniformity. We have differences, and we need to work through them together. You put two Presbyterians together, you're gonna to have probably at least three opinions. We're allowed to disagree, as long as we do so in love. You can even disagree with the church's leadership or the pastor if it is done in love. Paul begins this passage of scripture from Ephesians and says, I therefore the prisoner in the Lord. Paul wrote this letter as a prisoner from the political authorities in Rome. And this would definitely not be lost on the church of Ephesus. Paul is saying, you may see me in chains here, but in reality, it's I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. My identity is found in him. To Jesus is my loyalty. That loyalty leads us to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. 
And later in the letter, Paul will suggest that each of us as Christians need to submit to one another. Now, no one can deny that our society has become coarse and civility is a rare commodity these days. Kindness is not easy. However, in our efforts to be different than, this, than the culture, I would encourage the church and probably us Presbyterians to not to give in to the opposite temptation. Presbyterians are nice. I mean, heck, the most famous Presbyterian minister is Mr. Rogers. We are nice. We like nice, and we want others to play nice. But sometimes our niceness causes us to look the other way. We fail to confront or we remain silent out of a fear to offend others. However, our unity in Jesus Christ does not mean that we can excuse bad behavior or false teaching. Paul admonishes us to humility, but he doesn't take away our responsibility to stand for courage for what is right. Now, let's say we know someone who is doing something that he or she shouldn't be doing. I don't know, some sin, maybe... Someone's having an affair or gossiping or just some other sin, we, whatever it is. The temptation to be nice might suggest that we just ignore it. We're just going to love on them and hope that they'll change. Needless to say, that course of action will probably not work. Instead, Paul suggests that we come to our brother or sister in humility and gentleness. Before we can even say a word, we should be examining our own lives for sin. We don't reach out in condemnation. We acknowledge that all have sinned and fallen short, including myself, including me. Humility leads us to treat others as we would want to be treated, with sensitivity and respect. We call sin, sin. However, love leads us to help the person bear the burden. I'll take you to the marriage counseling session. I'll attend that AA meeting with you. I'll be your accountability partner. As a friend in Christ, I will stand with you. I will struggle with you. We seek reconciliation. And this demands a level of investment of others in others that's pretty high. And I would say, unless you're willing to do that, I wouldn't throw out judgments or shake a finger at another person. Unless you're willing to walk with them, keep your mouth shut. Be an extremist for love. When others called Martin Luther King Jr. an extremist, he took offense. But the more he thought about it, he grew to like the term. He once wrote, the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists will we be? Will we be extremists for hate or for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or for the extension of justice? In that dramatic scene on Calvary's Hill, three men were crucified. We must never forget that all three were crucified for the same crime, the crime of extremism. Two were extremists for immorality, and thus fell below their environment, the other Jesus Christ was an extremist for love. A recent survey asked visitors why they return and eventually become members of congregations. The number one reason was, quote, the congregation acts like it really believes Jesus is alive through a collective effervescence, in other words, a bubbling up, that pervades everything else that is done. This sense that Jesus is alive and actually guides us and leads us, this is something that people find attractive. Paul might have expressed it this way. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beg you to live a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. The first Presbyterian church meets here because this building is not the church. You are the church. And we're called to show the love and grace and mercy that God gave us in his son. Amen.